thank you for joining the free extract webinar today. We're going to be talking about Drill and Blast 101 with applications in open cut mining. Just a little bit about myself. My name is Stephen Putt. I've got about six years of industry experience, uh, five of which is Drill and Blast related, uh, and most of that has been in open cut coal throughout the U.S. and Australia. Today we have 40 people listening so far, still a few joining it looks like. Um, and just a breakdown of their experience, we have some people with some drill and blast, um, quite a bit of people with minimal mining or drill and blast, and then quite a few people that at least have some mining background. So drill and blast uh, is probably one of the most important operations in your average mine. Uh, typically if the drill and blast operations are going well, there's a very high likelihood that the mine will succeed. However, if the drill and blast operations are not going so well, you have lots of things that can go wrong. Elevated costs, broken equipment, and all types of environmental and safety issues. So the name of the game in mining is typically to get our high-valued coal or ore out to sell for a bit of a profit, hopefully. Um, the problem there is that usually these high-value commodities are buried well beneath a lot of waste rock. And that waste rock looks a little something like this typically have a pretty solid and massive sections built in with some joints or discontinuities um, that looks even more like this. Here we can see a bit of clay stone above coal and we have some joints running kind of horizontally as well as vertically and you can see that just the way the rock breaks up within this is a little bit um, just discontinued and uh, a bit random but always there. So, to make the mining game a little bit easier, we want to take our waste rock and break it into smaller pieces. Typically, we do this by adding a little bit of energy. In this case, we'll use sugar-free Red Bull. Sugar-free because we do not want the rock to weigh any more than it already does. So, when we add this energy, typically the rock will break up into smaller chunks, but it will do so along these weak planes. Um, in this case, we have a large rock that gets broken into four sections along its joints. But, we can do one step better than this. If we take that same amount of energy, break it down, and focus it between our weakness joints, we can then break our rock up into even smaller bits, basically just by using these joints to our advantage. And when I say this, we can have a look on the left, uh, and there's the joint planes running horizontally and vertically, and you can see how they do typically run um, just in sections along here, you can see them, and then running down north north and south. And when I say very little rocks, we have to think of a relative scale based on our equipment. And on the right, we have one of the larger excavating pieces of equipment. It's a Liveyear 9800. And that doesn't exactly need pebbles to dig through, but more basketball-sized rocks is probably adequate. Anything up towards the size of a scooter, that's probably a little too hard to manage. So again, it's just thinking relative when we say very little. And I think even you inexperienced people should know that no matter how much Red Bull that we pour on a rock, it's not exactly going to do anything. Red Bull is also very expensive, so we need to find a better form of energy to break our rocks. And the most suitable form in our case will be ANFO, which stands for Ammonium Nitrate Fuel Oil. It's one of the most widely used commercial explosives. It is very cheap and contains quite a bit of energy. It also has the added benefit of creating a very large amount of gas. So one kilogram of ANFO, when detonated, will give us about a thousand liters of usable gas, which is very effective in breaking our rock. And in our ANFO, or most commercial explosives for that matter, we have a few typical ingredients. We have our heat or fuel source, which in this case is just common diesel. Uh, when we light diesel on fire, it will just kind of burn slowly, so we need to add a bit more um, oxygen to it to make it burn faster. And in this case, these are called oxidizers, which in ANFO is ammonium nitrate. Ammonium nitrate is 60% oxygen, and when we add that to our fuel burning, it turns this burning reaction into a very, very fast reaction, which goes at about 4,000 meters per second. So quite fast and quite violent. Um, to this, we can add sensitizers such as air or other types of gas, small micro balloons. 
which will just aid in our reaction and speed it up a little bit. And the same is true of confinement. We need our explosives to be well confined and tightly compact to have our reaction go quickly. So now that we know a little bit about a uh, little bit of explosives, we'll just elaborate. Um, more of these uh, typical fuel and ammonium nitrate blends. We have ANFO, heavy ANFO, which is just ANFO mixed with emulsion. Emulsion, just a third to, from the top, is basically ammonium nitrate dissolved in water with some additives such as emulsifiers or thickeners and fuel, which basically just form a gel type substance, typically used in wet applications. We also have low density products or packaged products, which are just variations of emulsions. Now we also have ratings on the right for water resistance. We have shock and heave energy. Shock energy is typically just how fast our explosive detonates, and heave energy is typically just how much gas is created from that detonation. And we also have cost. You can see that ANFO is the cheapest explosive. The more emulsion we add, typically the better the waterproof capability and the more expensive. Now the great thing about all these explosives is that they are very easy to handle and very safe. Uh, if you were to fire a rifle bullet into any of these, there's a very, very low likelihood that they would detonate. So to detonate these, we need to use better forms of explosives, which are called high explosives. These are basically more chemically sound compounds that are easier to detonate and can help us to detonate our commercial explosives. So just that little gold piece is just a standard detonator, which is a very small explosive. This will happily blow off your hand if you are holding on to it. We typically put that into the booster, which is the green uh, little bit on the right, and that will destroy a car. So we typically put the detonator in the booster, and those two together will detonate our, high ex our explosives on the left, so our ANFOs and our emulsions. Uh, you can see that high explosives are, in fact, very high shock energy and also very expensive, but they are required for our other explosives. So now that we know a little bit about rocks and a little bit about explosives, let's see what happens when we mix the two together. So here we have a uniform rock. Again, there's no joints in this, so it's just a standard piece of rock, and we've got a small column of ANFO in the middle. When we detonate, you will see we get a shock wave, cracks that form from this high pressure, and then as our gas expands, our rocks will move outward. And I'll slow this down for a bit and go through it in sections. So once again, we'll have our initial detonation, which causes a little bit of crushed area right around the detonation due to the high pressures and heat involved. And this will then, as gas expands, cause a shock wave going through the rock. And as our pressures increase in the detonation, the pressure exceeds the strength of the rock, causes these cracks, and then allows our gas to expand into our cracks and push the rock outward. And typically when rocks are pushed outward, they'll fall, hit the ground, hit other rocks, and continue to break further. So this is what happens in a, in a uniform rock. So let's go to a more realistic case where we have multiple charges in a rock with natural joints throughout. Now in this case, you'll see that some of the cracks in energy actually escape into our, our weakness joints and planes. And this is basically because explosives always try to find the path of least resistance. It's just like water. It's going to try to find the easiest way to escape out of our rock. And here you can see, in this case, the cracks have gone into our natural joints and have strayed away from some sections that we may have wanted cracks in. So something to consider when we do try to place charges in rocks, you need to take joints into account. And likewise, if we look at a section view of a typical uh, mining geology, you'll have joints, faults, you'll also have hard bands such as coal or clay, or sorry, soft bands such as coal or clay, and hard bands such as sandstone or any solid type ore. Now when we detonate near our hard and soft bands, you'll see that shock waves and cracks will travel faster and farther in the hard bands, and they will travel slower and not as far in our softer bands. And in the same way, our cracks and energy will try to escape out of our harder areas into our softer areas, and soft areas can include open air at the surface. It will also try to escape into any larger faults or weakness planes, and again into the surface. But if we have an ideal case on the right with just minimal weakness planes and joints, 
you'll have uniform breakage and uniform cracks still with some um, tendency to go to the surface. And just to get a little bit better view of how this looks, we've got a pretty detailed model there showing your crush zone, your highly fractured areas, and then your cracks forming outward from there. And again, we do have some expression going up to the surface. So, the easiest way to get our explosives into the rock is to first drill a hole. To do that, we need to have what we call basically overburden or quarry drills, which are the most commonly type uh, used drills. And on the left in that red, we have an overburden drill, fairly sizable piece of equipment. Um, they're usually anywhere from 10 to 20 meters high and can be quite long, just about the size of an average highway truck. Uh, these are usually track mounted and contrary to popular belief, just because they are on tracks does not mean they can go anywhere. They are qu actually quite limited in their maneuverability and typically struggle on angles greater than 10 to 15 degrees, and that's both front to back and side to side. Now these drills, these overburden drills, can typically drill angled holes anywhere up to 25 and sometimes 30 meters. Uh, the only limitation with overburden drills is typically they can drill in 5 degree increments, so 0, 5, 10 for example, and there is no such thing as a 3 degree or a 13 degree hole. It's either 0, 5, 10. The quarry drills, which are on the, that small drill on the right, can drill a variety of angles due to its hydraulic arms and drill mast. Um, typically, you can drill underneath itself, you can drill left, right, horizontally. Um, the only thing with quarry drills is they are a bit limited as far as depth is concerned. Um, so, nice to have, but typically limited with depth. And the business end of the drill, which is the drill bit, uh, we have two very common forms. You've got the tricone bit and a drag bit. A tricone bit typically uses a very large downward force and rotation to take small bites out of the rock. So you'll have small chips that form, whereas the drag bit is more of a chainsaw approach, just raw power and rotation, and just scrapes away the rock. Common bit sizes for the two, we have anything from 32 millimeters all the way up to 380. 80 millimeters, the most common size being around the 229 or 270 millimeter range. Now typically with your drill bit, you'll have an equally sized drill steel, and these both will go down into the hole, rotating, and while they rotate, the drill also forces some type of fluid, air or water, through the steel, through the bit, and then forces the air out of the hole, and this is basically to clean any rock bits out of the hole. Just to show how our two bits will handle in soft and hard material, you'll quickly see that the drag bit is much more suited in soft material. Once it gets into hard rock, it typically overheats and then fails, whereas the tricone bit is pretty evenly suited for both, but does take a little bit longer to drill. And once our holes have been drilled, like I said, there's typically drill cuttings and little rock bits that are stuck in the hole, and we use our air and fluid to blow those to the top of the hole. So once we have our drill and we're ready, um, just have a look at our typical drill bench. Uh, to the left, we've got a mining service that's been removed, leaving a free face and another bench. And in this case, our mining will be progressing to the right. So here we have, uh, we can see drill holes laid out on a grid type pattern. Um, this is pretty standard. And uh, typically we have holes that are laid out along what we call rows. So this is typically the longer dimension of our drill bench. And in this case, the distance between these rows, as we can see at the top left of our diagram, is called the drilled burden. So that's basically just the space between our rows. And then our holes along our rows, the distance between those is called our spacing. So an average drill burden and spacing would be approximately 7 by 8 meters. Um, that's just a quick rough um, estimation. And once we are ready, once we have our burden and spacings figured out and we're ready to drill, we'll put our holes along these grids, and now we are ready to load our explosives. So, we'll load our explosives into the hole, add our detonator and booster, and then one last important thing is to add stemming on the top of our hole. So that's just right here, our stem height. Typically, stemming is just a type of gravel or dirt that we can put on top of our explosive column, and that aids in just containing the energy in the rock. It's almost like putting a bottle cap on.
And once we are ready, we have everything loaded, detonated, and stemmed. We are ready to blast. However, it's not that easy. If we are to detonate all holes in our blast pattern, we have a variety of problems ranging from uh, environmental impacts and including poor fragmentation. So what we need to do is add some delays to our massive explosion to break it into smaller bits and be better uh, for both the environment and our digging equipment. So we have a few options. You can detonate a few holes at a time. Sometimes one hole at once is also an option. Or if you really wanted, you could just have sporadic holes going off willy-nilly. Uh, also, you can do rows at a time, or a more elegant approach, which is more commonly used, which is basically called single hole firing, which looks something like this. And basically the way that we time our shots is based on how we want our dirt to move and how broken we want it to be. Do we want it to come out to the free face, to the left, to the right, or sometimes we just want the shot to get fluffed up a little bit and just move up. And this is all dependent on our mining equipment um, and things like access and where we're going to come into our blasts. Um, just some basic equipment down below. We have a shovel, dragline, loader, and excavator. Shovels and excavators typically like a rock pile that's a bit higher, uh, basically minimal movement just to get fluffed up a little bit so they can come in and dig. A loader needs a bit more of a shallow profile, and a drag line, in most cases, the more you can move the rock into the face, the better. And this is all controlled by our timing and our delay systems. So just a few of the tools that we use to add our delays into our shots. Uh, these are called our initiation systems. Uh, we've got a few to pick from, the first being debt cord. Debt cord is basically just a high explosive rope. Um, typically runs at about 7,000 meters per second, so it's quite fast. It is also quite cheap. Um, just a few of the issues with it are is that when it's exposed to water, um, it typically tends to not do as well, and there's also some issues with just gaps in the high explosives core, which can cause cutoffs. Next, we have a less common system, which is called electronic detonators. These are basically just a copper wire, which you can throw an electric signal down to our detonator, and then there's typically a delay fuse, ranging from 25, 50, and 75s, and so on. Um, and these are commonly used in underground mines, um, but are, like I said, not very common in open-cut operations. The most common type, non-electrics as they're called, is basically a system which has uh, long, thin plastic tubes which are hollowed out and filled with a gas and powder. Now these run a little bit slower than debt cord, but still burn at about 2,000 meters per second. Now the benefit about non-electrics is they're very safe, very easy to use, and they can be more or less interchanged. And their delay, system, their delay sets, which are shown at the bottom, were basically designed with minimal uh, vibration and maximum fa fragmentation in mind. So these are basically an idiot-proof and bulletproof system, which is also quite cheap to use. And the newer systems coming out, called electronic systems, uh, the same setup as an electric detonator, but when the electric, the electric signal gets to our detonator, it then starts a computer chip countdown. And this countdown can range from 1 millisecond to 15,000 milliseconds, or 15 seconds. Now, these are highly accurate due to the computer chip and a capacitor-based um, detonating system that then sets off our boosters. These are very, very accurate, but also require a lot of control to maintain their accuracy and functionality. And just to give you a picture of what these delays would look like, we've got here a 100 meter setup, uh, just 100 meters of each system, with a 100 millisecond delay in the detonator at the end. So if we set them off all at the same time, you will see that in less than one millisecond, our electric signal has reached our detonators, the electrics and the electronic detonators, and those can then count down the 100 millisecond delay. The other systems, you'll see, take a little bit longer, Debt cord shortly then reaches the detonator, and then non-electrics take a little bit longer. You'll see once we get to 100 milliseconds, our electric systems will go off, followed by our debt cord, and eventually our non-electric system. Now, the only difference between the two electric systems is that the, electric, the electronic 
is basically instantly at 100 milliseconds delay. Whereas the electric detonator, since it has an actual fuse element, they are sometimes unreliable on getting that exact amount and typically will be 2 to 3 percent off. And with these systems, we typically have delays that run on the surface and in the hole. So these are our surface delays and our in hole delays. Typically, you want to use both just to make sure that our entire surface delays go off. And I'll show you an example of that quickly. If we have no in-hole delay, our surface line will run and our holes will go off as our surface line hits them. The problem with this is that the explosion cause does actually cause quite a bit of disturbance in the ground around it. And this can cause disruption to the surface line itself, which in this case causes a cutoff. So those last three holes are not able to detonate. Whereas if we add in-hole in delays, our surface line runs completely across our holes while our in-hole delay still burns away and eventually can detonate all holes. And I'll show that one more time. Again, surface line completes and our in-hole delays are allowed to go off without disturbing the surface delays. So how do we time our surface delays? It's basically just a matter of how we want our rock to behave and again what equipment we're using but I'll just show a few examples. If for example we have no delays we have all four holes going off at the same time you'll have a single crack that will form between the holes and minimal movement occurring from the gas energy. Now, this is typically not ideal but there are some special applications where we would do this. So we need to add delays to make these holes break a little bit better. However, if we add too much of a delay, our cracks are allowed to form completely and stray beyond our um, subsequent holes. This allows all of our energy to escape into the already existing cracks from hole to hole. So this does give us a little bit better fragmentation, a little bit better movement, but is still not quite ideal. So we need to speed our delays up a little bit. However, again, if we go too fast, our cracks will form together quite nicely but will not allow our, rocks, allow our rocks to move effectively. So if we just watch the red bits in the middle, our holes detonate, but the rocks around them have not moved enough to quite allow them to escape um, ideally. Now basically we need to find a happy medium between all of these cases. You want to have a nice fragmentation with a little bit of movement typically depending on your rock type and equipment types. So that's our hole by hole delays. Now let's look at our row by row delays. And just at the top right, we're just showing that we'll have a set of rows go off once at a time. And the same principles apply. The faster we go, the more broken our rock will be. And the slower we go, the more it will move. So on the left, we'll have fast. And if you just watch that brighter bit of red in the middle, you can see that it doesn't quite have anywhere to go when the blast detonates, which makes cracks form a little bit further. On the right, we allow plenty of time for all of our rock to move ahead, still have some cracking that will happen in, our, in all of our rows, but it's not as much as faster timing. So again, just trying to find a happy medium between these two scenarios. So I'll just show a few examples. Um, the first will show a relatively fast timing. Uh, in which we want our rock to simply move up. So here we'll see a very fast detonation followed by, in this area, the rock will simply fluff up. And not move very far side to side. Apologies if the video quality does get slow for some of you. There's a, typically seems to be some issues with some networks at certain sites. And we'll just go one more video. This is a slower delay in which we try to move our rock as far as possible. This is called throw blasting. So in that case, we use slow delays along our rows to allow our rock to move as far as possible. And just some common issues that can occur along the way. 
Um, typically, the biggest problem that I've seen is just getting the drill set up correct. So obviously, we want our explosives to go in, in the exact correct spots. And the first step in doing so is getting our drill holes in the correct spots to be able to do this. Sometimes you'll see drill benches that are uneven, unprepared properly, and therefore don't allow us to get drill holes where we need them. Once we have our drill holes in place, then it comes down to loading. There are several ways that we can have improper loading techniques, such as not enough boosters, boosters in the wrong position, inadequate stemming heights, so we're not containing our energy properly, using the wrong explosives for the ground conditions or water conditions, or sometimes just not checking our holes to make sure there's no voids or escaping drill holes. Next we have timing. Uh, it's often the case that timing is not considered for the certain equipment types or for our rock types. So it's very important to make sure that we consider our joints, rock hardnesses, and equipment types before we time our shots. Inadequate drill design, so using the wrong diameters, putting holes too close to free faces, or simply just having holes spaced too far or too close. Also, just remembering the equipment purpose. Uh, again, we do not need small pebbles for large equipment. That's just making sure that we're spending the right amount of money um, and the right amount of time on all of our systems. Uh, another problem usually, when we do have a blast, there's always damaged rock around the blast. So it's making sure that we have large, efficient blasts to make sure that we minimize damage around our shots. And then, of course, having an adequate feedback loop making sure that when things do go well or not so well, we learn and implement those into our future designs. Now, if any of these common issues do come back to get us, typically you'll have safety, environmental, and community impacts. Um, and the largest problems we'll see are typically as follows. We'll have high vibration due to too, many, too much explosives, not contained explosives, which can cause air blast or overpressure, and sometimes fly rock and then also blast fume, which can be caused by inadequate detonation or a variety of other problems in the hole. And these can all lead to injuries, damage, complaints from the community, or sometimes a loss of license, which is not good. So just some things to think about, um, and typically with explosives, any changes that we make, it's always best to do slow and steady, small changes, um, just to make sure that any of these factors don't come to bite us. And that is pretty much all for today. I'll just leave my contact details on the screen and maybe answer a few questions. Uh, for those of you that have to go, thank you for joining us today. Once again, this has been a free extract webinar on Drill and Blast. And a few questions. Uh, so this first question, are we talking about exploration drilling or drilling for blasting? And this is basically, I hope as you've seen, this is more based towards drilling to break rock, so drilling and then adding explosives um, in production applications, whereas exploration drilling is simply just drilling deep holes, mainly to get uh, some type of idea of the rock below. Another question, do we pack tight the stemming? Typically stemming, uh, when we talk about it in blast holes, is going to be some type of gravel or just drill cuttings. Um, typically those are just poured in or dumped in. Um, there's really not much packing that goes along. The reason we use gravel is because it is quite heavy and fits in the blast hole quite tight. Next question. How do the faults, deep faults in rock get identified? What tools are used? Uh, there's a variety of tools to find faults in ground. Um, Typically, when a driller is drilling, he'll be able to tell where there are some cracking or weak material, and he can write those down on what's called just a drill log sheet. Um, there's also advanced systems that use GPS or things called gamma logging, which use radiation, um, that can be used to find a bit more detailed um, faults or rocks. Um, the importance of drilling accuracy and impact on muck pile and effectiveness of the blast. Uh, this is pretty important because, like I've said, typically when we design a blast pattern, we have our explosive that needs to go in certain areas where we've picked. However, when you get them in the wrong areas, we're not going to have the behavior that we want. So it is 
I would say probably one of the most critical factors in getting our blast to go properly is getting our drilling in the correct spot. And even if we don't get it in the correct spot, it's good to jot that down and then readjust our timing or loading design to suit. Um, another question, what is the rough cost of a drill and blast of say 64 holes over a 5 meter high area? Incorporating typical blasting explosives and labor, are we talking about 20,000? Uh, typically the number I would give you would be about 70 cents per BCM. Uh, I wouldn't worry about how many holes go into that. Um, on a 5 meter high bench, you may be looking around more of a 65 cent range, but I would just use that for a basic factor. So once again, 70 cents per BCM. What are common KPIs of drill and blast? Uh, typically when there's uh, a blast goes off, we want to make sure that, first of all, that the dirt has moved into the right areas. Second of all, that it is broken effectively, which usually you cannot tell until it is dug by the equipment. Sometimes you'll have hard bands towards the bottom of the rock piles, uh, etc. And then probably the most important is that nothing bad has happened from the blast. So there's no faults that have opened, no cracks that have escaped beyond our drill bench, and that nothing was damaged or nobody was injured. Which leads into the next question, what operational health and safety factors do the miners and inspectors consider when looking at a mine's drill and blast operations? Typically the things that they're after are all of the safety checks, so just making sure that all of our explosives have been used and recorded, basically making sure that no theft has happened from any of our detonators um, or boosters. Also things like fume presence or fly rock, any of these adverse effects. Um, but they typically do not care too much about the actual fragmentation, unless, of course, it is causing equipment damage upon digging. Um, is there any risk of moving to electronic detonation systems for things like mobile phones setting off blasts, blasts accidentally? Uh, electronic systems are actually very safe, um, just because the computer involved in the detonators has an encryption system. So it doesn't just need an electric signal, it needs an electric signal plus a basically a number code that matches that detonator. Um, electric systems, so the older systems, did have some issues with stray current, but um, as long as you took proper precautions, they were all right. So no mobile phones cannot set off electronic detonators. Do they drill larger holes like rises for rock to break into like underground? Uh, these, if I know what you're talking about, uh, this would be something like a box cut. So typically when a mine starts out, um, you obviously need to break into the ground to start digging. And to do this, you have to utilize the freeze face, which is actually the surface. So if you were to take a standard underground blast and rotate it to where it's pointing down, um, you would actually use a similar design and a surface to do a box cut type operation. So yes. Uh, yes, we will be emailing out uh, future seminars. We are probably without, before too long, we'll have a um, separate type of training course that can elaborate on some of these topics. Uh, drill and blast is quite a detailed um, topic. Typically a training course would go from anywhere from three days to a week. Um, but yes, we'll certainly be sending out uh, more information soon. Typical explosives used in underground workings with high amounts of water in the blasting area. This is typically more packaged type explosives or high explosives such as dynamite. Uh, I cannot say I have too much experience with underground blasting, but typically they are uh, some sort of packaged emulsion uh, with some type of sensitizer such as aluminum. Um, but like I said, I do not have too much underground experience. Once again, thank you to anybody signing off.